love booktube i've been watching a bunch of wonderful q a videos on various booktube channels mark at book time with elvis has been doing a q a uh greg it's supposedly fun is answering his q a questions one question per uh friday reads video uh, which i think would, would take me forever if i did if i did that and recently uh in honor of his 100th uh saturday hodgepodge video brian at bookish put out a call for questions and answered them on uh, a recent video and in that video although he answers my own question about what the difference is if any between a uh saturday hodgepodge q a and a saturday hodgepodge q and on <laughs> in that video elsewhere in the video as an offhand kind of tossed off throat clearing comment he mentions that steve can make videos for 40 minutes about nothing naturally i was stung I like to think of this channel as content rich. Uh, I went to my friend Deb and said, am I tedious? And she said, I've been calling you tedious since the thirties, the 1630s. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I need to correct that. So I immediately took to the iPad in order to make a mega stuff video. The first one I made in a long time, a sort of omnium gathering video where I pull together a whole bunch of things that are on my mind. This is going to be an intensely content heavy video. There'll be no way for invidious carpers in the peanut gallery to say this is a video about nothing. Uh, so we're going to start off with we'll a bunch of different categories. We have a lot of ground to cover now that the drag race is over. We have, we have a lot of ground to cover. So we'll start off with the news. There's one thing that I want to kind of sort of graveyard laugh about because there's not much else you can do. And another thing that I want to kind of sort of graveyard laugh about but also ask you about because it touches on ethical things, on personal things. And I am incredibly nosy. I want to know everything there is to know about you. So the two that I have, that I have jotted down here, the first one is Madison Cawthorn. A uh, Nazi congressman who was a uh, very vocal and active participant in the armed insurrection to overthrow the government of my country and substitute it with hereditary rule by Donald Trump and his family. Uh, Madison Cawthorn is fairly loathsome. He's a fairly loathsome individual. Uh, but and, and I'm keeping an eye on him because he is going to rule this country. He's a loathsome individual, but he is a favored son and beloved spokesperson for what I believe is a Nazi majority in this country. Uh, and But nevertheless, the, the, the story that comes to mind for this particular Mega Stuff video is funny. In a whistling past the graveyard kind of way, there's actually nothing on a lower level, on a deeper level, there's nothing funny about Madison Cawthorn. He does not believe in democracy. He wants to change this country into an, an uh, autocratic regime. He wants to change it fundamentally, not not change this country in the way that a lot of fake elected politicians say, like, I want a fair chance for everyone, two chickens in every pot, that sort of thing. He wants to change this from a free representative democracy into an autocracy in which most people don't have a vote and in which the rule is, is carried on by force rather than by election. Now, needless to say, I disagree with that. And the fact that he can get elected to Congress, that he can get that close to the hot wires of power believing and wanting all of those things is terrifying but it can still be funny and in the news just recently he he wrote a note he had wrote a note to a fellow member of congress and somehow it got photographed and released maybe he photographed and released it but one way or another uh the note has to be seen to be believed I, there's no other way to put it it has to be seen to be believed not just the content we'll get to the content in a minute but also the presentation it is not handwritten it is it is laboriously block printed. It will strike you. Many, many people on Twitter have already said that if they, they had to double and triple check to make sure that it was real because it looks like a parody. It looks like a child wrote it, which is why, which is why Twitter immediately dubbed it Billy Madison Cawthorn <laughs> because, because it looks like a small child wrote it. And, uh, I, I wish that I had the ability to put a picture right up here, but you can easily Google it. It's the story of the day in a funny kind of mock the Nazis way. It's the story of the day. And uh, I thought that was really funny. I laughed at it myself, especially Billy Madison Cawthorn. Every once in a while when I think that Twitter is just a cesspit that gives me nothing in return for the time I spend on it, then I get something fun like that. And our second story is also about Twitter, so we'll get to that. But the, uh, the deeper 
part of this Billy Madison Cawthorn story uh, is that it's not just the handwriting. The note is also written by a moron. It's, it's written by, if not a moron, a small child. And that reinforces, in a way, uh, along the same lines as a lot of things re were reinforced in the last five years in America, for me, in terms of reading histories of the 1930s in Germany and the rise of the Nazi party. A univ an almost universal reaction to the rise of the Nazi party, to people who, in, to German journalists who interviewed apparatchiks of that party when it was a, just a normal political party before it had invaded Poland uh, and opened concentration camps. The almost universal reaction of German journalists who interviewed people from that party was, these people are really dumb. <laughs> it, it, I leave apart the systematic, absolutely pitch black evil of their professed intentions. In a, aside from all that, these are really noticeably stupid people. And that reaction went all the way up to the top before Hitler became uh, a synonym for the ultimate evil in human existence. It, most people that encountered him thought this guy is either really stupid or genuinely clinically insane or both. Uh, and uh, I, can't, I couldn't help but read those accounts with a greater and different emphasis after the last five years. When you have members of the American Nazi Party bringing snowballs onto the, the well of the Senate in order to mock catastrophic climate change while one half of the United States burns. Uh, we, we have, when, the, when the certain group that I'm talking about talk, in addition to being evil, they also sound really dumb. I know uh, Georgia's own Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene is a perfect example of that, sort of the the uh, the er example of that. Now that we don't talk about Sarah Palin anymore, now that Sarah Palin is not part of the elected life of the country, she Marjorie Taylor Greene is sort of the the, the quint quintessence of that because she doesn't need to open her mouth for more than a minute before you realize. Well, okay, I might be able to use her if I if I want to further a political agenda, and she happens to say that agenda. I might be able to use her, but she only needs to open her mouth for anyone, one way or another, to think this is a really stupid person. This is someone who just doesn't understand the world around her at all, and has somehow managed to bully her way into a position of power despite that fact. And when I read that the Billy Madison Cawthorn note, that's all I could think about is that when this country changes in 2022, and especially in 2024, it will be at the hands of some of the dumbest people in the country. And that that's really sobering, but it was also kind of funny. <laughs> it was also kind of funny, as long as it's still possible to mock these people, I, I'm all, all in favor of doing that. But that brings us to our second, our second subject for this first part of our, uh, our mega stuff Oreo, our mega stuff video for August, and that is the conservative hate monger Stephen Crowder. Calls himself a comedian whenever anyone threatens a lawsuit, but it, and he holds a YouTube channel that has been banned by YouTube, blocked by YouTube, shadow banned by YouTube, demonetized by YouTube. YouTube won't just play and get rid of him because his audience is too big, even though he has been endlessly vile, just endlessly vile. Some of you may know this guy. Not only because he very melodramatically wears a holster gun to his studio. I don't know what that says about the crowd of sycophantic assistants that are there. Oh, they are hired, they are paid only to laugh at his dumb jokes. His dumb, racist, sexist, bigoted jokes. But some of you may know him because if you are on Twitter at all, and keep in mind I don't advise that. If you're on Twitter at all, you might remember from a couple of years ago, uh, the, I guess, YouTube commentator or former Vox commentator, Carlos Maza put together a super clip of Crowder's uh, homophobic utterances. His, you, you, if you watch his, his channel for any length of time, you're going to come up with a supercut about offensive comments about a whole bunch of things. Maza, who is gay, put together a, a supercut of just vile comments about gay people and posted it on Twitter with a simple call to Twitter, or a simple call to YouTube saying, why are you still platforming this guy? This is in clear violation of your rules. Why is he still on your channel? Carlos Maza, I think, knew exactly what the answer was, but nevertheless, that triggered an ad apocalypse that directed a lot of hate Carlos Maza's way that I don't think was warranted. It's not, pointing out the problem doesn't make you the problem. It's Crowder who was the problem. And Crowder is, he's a fast-talking, brainless grifter. He would be doing 
an odious individual, racist, sexist, transphobic in the genuine sense of the word, uh, bigoted in every way, homophobic, just a horrible, odious person. And recently, again, you'll know this if you were on Twitter, he had a collapsed lung, a serious medical condition, ended up in the hospital, somehow managed to tweet pictures of himself, even from his hospital bed, with a camera looking down at his face with an oxygen tube up his nose, and mentioning in his captions that he had taken a turn for the worse. This is a couple of a couple of days ago. That he'd taken a turn for the worse, that he was getting lots and lots of blood transfusions. As far as I know, he's still in the hospital. My assumption is that the taken a turn for the worse, that the blood transfusions, all of that is a lie. I have never known Stephen Crowder when I've watched any clips or dug into any research on him to tell the truth about anything. I don't see why he would tell the truth now, why he would suddenly make a, a right turn and tell the truth about his own medical condition. I think it's all just to gin up attention. But let's say it's true, and the chance is that he is in the hospital with a collapsed lung. This is a, 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 a young guy, yes, but he chain smokes cigars, and he has for years. So it, he doesn't have much in the way of pulmonary health to begin with. And uh, Let's say that all of that is true, and that he's in the hospital, and that he's on death's doorstep. I mean, a collapsed lung is no small thing. It can, it, if the other one collapses, you can't breathe anymore. Uh, the point that I want to make here is, is a question, an ethical question, because the minute Crowder posted that picture of himself online, on Twitter, with oxygen tubes up his nose saying that he'd taken a turn for the worse, that he'd felt the presence of death, that it was that close, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that 90%, 95% of Twitter erupted with joy. Hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands and thousands of people posting uh, jubilant memes, asking, Are, is he dead yet? Hoping that he would die, wishing that he would die, saying that if they were in the room, they would tell the doc they would pay the doctors to pull the plug, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and the minuscule right-wing presence on Twitter at least that I've seen, maybe it's bigger than I think, immediately said, oh, look at these vile lefties. Look at how horrible their behavior is wishing death on someone who's, who's posted a picture of himself in intensive care. Uh, and re leaving aside for a minute whether or not Crowder was lying, and leaving aside for a minute whether or not a public forum like Twitter that identifies you when you make comments pro or con is the right place for such reactions. If you if you privately were refreshing Twitter wondering if this guy that you hate is going to die and maybe privately taking pleasure in it because it's one less really influential evil person in the world, I would suspect the operative word there would be private and that you wouldn't make those sentiments public. Uh, leaving aside all of that, the ethical question is for me to you just because I'm nosy, just because if I were to, if we were on a dog walk together, I would ask you all sorts of nosy questions. I would do. Uh, is where do you stand on that subject? Stephen Crowder has never done anything good with his life at all. He fleeces his his money subscribers specifically by lying to them. He lies to them about uh, Black Lives Matter. He lies to them about the uh, January 6th violent insurrection to overthrow the government of my country. He lies to them about the misdeeds of the Trump administration. He lies to them about COVID. Uh, just you name it and he lies to them about it he's even had segments on his show where he actually claims that smoking is healthy he lies to his to his viewers all the time spreads huge amounts of misinformation and seems to be an odious person just in general even in his private life where he insists that his toadies in the studio laugh at his stupid jokes where he he bought the most attractive wife that his tax bracket could afford and likes to joke about that in private just all sorts of horrible odious stuff if you have someone like that someone who isn't doing any good in the world they're instead only doing active harm where do you stand on the subject if they i mean if he was undergoing a medical treatment on his own in private but he didn't keep it private he posted pictures of himself saying that he was on death's doorstep if someone does that where do you stand on the subject of whether or not you think it's okay to publicly say that you'll hope he doesn't make it do you agree with a lot of people on Twitter who at least are virtue signaling that it's totally wrong to wish death on someone no matter who that someone is? Or do you draw a line? And if you draw a line, where do you draw the line? Is Steven Crowder, if you know who he is, if you're one of the tiny, I hope a tiny number of people watching this video who knows who he is, if you know who he is and you hate him, I'm assuming that if you know who he is, you hate him. 
is he bad enough? So that if he publicly posted about being in the ICU, maybe not making it out alive, you might say, well, I hope he doesn't make it out alive, or I hope at least he's so impaired that he can't continue to spread misinformation on his show. Do you think it's okay when a person is that bad, when there's no upside uh, to, to what they're contributing to the world? If you, if, like, for instance, if you, if you were to hear that's one of the torture apologists for the Bush administration, one of the legal people trained at Harvard and Yale went in front of district courts in order to say the torture was okay when America does it. The torture was acceptable when America does it. There are people in the Bush administration who made those arguments. They go home to their wife and kids. That is objectively just about as evil as you can do without conducting the tortures yourself. If you knew that, well, that someone like that, if someone like that advertised that they were dying, would you admit, would you advertise that you were happy about it? Where, where do you stand in relation to the, public, the publicification of all of those sentiments that used to be private? Right? We'd all agree that our world has become more public. For good or ill, a lot of the stuff that would once have been private in all of our lives is now public. Right down to that letter by Billy Madison Cawthorn. That would once not have been public. Uh, given that fact, is the expression of, uh, well, we could fairly call it uncharitable, is the expression of uncharitable reactions to public figures, to the news of public figures, has that become more acceptable for you? Do you do it more often? Especially if you if you spend a, a lot of time on Twitter, too much time on Twitter, any time on Twitter. I'd love to hear that. I'm not so much interested in the Steven Crowder story itself because I don't think he's telling the truth. I think he's lying. about. If he's lied about everything else, then why wouldn't he lie about this? So I don't think he was ever in any medical danger. I think this was all down to gin up support for his mug club or whatever. But uh, leaving aside any of that, the, the larger issue that he raises is public behavior, I guess. That's the issue that I'm really getting at here is public social, be social media behavior. What is yours and what do you think is right and not right? When you hear the, if you know who Steven Crowder is and you hear the news that he is deathly ill, what do you think is the correct response? Or if I, if I can use a, maybe a slightly, more, uh, a slightly more electrifying example, let's say it was Stephen Miller, the openly avowed dead-eyed Nazi who was, in, who was one of Donald Trump's foremost advisors for the entirety of the, Donald, the first Donald Trump administration. What if you heard that Stephen Miller was on death's door? What if he pronounced that? He went on Twitter and said, I, they've, def they've discovered a, a tumor in my brain. It's inoperable. It looks bad. And he posted a picture of himself in his hospital bed. What would your public response be? And would you feel ashamed of it if it was really bad? I, I'd love, I love the, those issues, regardless of whether or not Steven Crowder is, is unhealthy at all. He posted a picture of himself in a hospital bed. That could be even a minor experience. He posted another picture of uh, a liter bag of blood and said, I've already taken six of these or something like that. But he didn't post a picture of the liter bag of blood connected to himself. So it could it could all be a lie, but it raises questions about online behavior uh, that I think are fascinating. So that's, that's the news part of this jam-packed, not at all about nothing, mega stuff video. So now we're going to move on. We'll move on to mail. I've got some mail that I want to show you, starting with the Martha's Vineyard Gazette. Uh, this is a uh, an old-style broadsheet newspaper for the island of Martha's Vineyard, a wonderful thing uh, that's full of... Uh, Island news, island obituaries, all that sort of thing, and also in this issue, uh, the the Vineyard Gazette bookshelf, uh, where I am the mainstay feature. <laughs> I, am the, I am the mainstay reviewer of the Martha's Vineyard Gazette. And I do a lot more reviewing in the summer than I do in the off season, uh, just as the the vineyard's population goes up by fifty times, and there are lots more books. Uh, and this time, I did a book that we saw on this channel, uh, Strange Love by Fred Waitzkin. Who wrote Searching for Bobby Fisher? Uh, an affectionate review. Not it was a slim little thing, just just a hundred pages long, so it didn't require any kind of doctrinal thesis or anything. But but uh, I'm in the latest Gazette, uh, which is basically even though the the Martha's Vineyard is home to many multimillionaires, uh, the Vineyard Gazette is still a small town newspaper. Really, it is. I mean, it, it deals with local school boards, local municipal boards, that sort of thing. The outer world almost never touches the Vineyard Gazette. 
except when it forces itself in. The Gazette has had many front page stories about COVID-19. How could it not? I remember watching. I get the, the Gazette every week in the mail. And I remember watching where, the, I remember reading the issue where COVID had not yet reached the island, where there were no confirmed cases. And then I remember reading the next issue where there was a confirmed case. And, and so on from there. Uh, the other periodical that we have here is also a small town paper. And that is this, Smoke Signals, Big Canoe News in Northern Georgia, uh, which is a big, I don't know if you can see this, it's a big full color newspaper, many, many uh, sections, all in full color. So there's there's news, there's local stuff. It's This is not exactly like the Vineyard Gazette because it covers lots of broader subjects. There are lots of, uh, of editorials and guest features. Let me show you uh, one of those features. A uh, popular lecturer, a popular Big Canoe lecturer, uh, did a full page spread on Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Has nothing to do, it's not, it's not Thomas Jefferson and John Adams' connection with Northern Georgia, it's just on them. There's, in other words, lots of general interest stuff in Big Canoe News in Northern Georgia. And the reason I bring it up, as, as those of you who watch this channel will know, is because uh, they recently hired me as their book section editor for the first time in decades. I am once again the book section editor of a small, a, a paid book section editor for a small print newspaper in a small town. It's not in the American Midwest for, for a long time, a long time ago. It was one little paper after another in the American Midwest. But a lot of those times, those jobs were arts editor. So it was a book review now and then, but it was also the local theater is, is having an Orson Welles revival. You got to write about that. A local author has, has a new Vanity Press book. You got to go and interview them. Though When you're an arts editor, you have to do all that sort of stuff. And there's all sorts of people who want little nibbles of your space. Here's a column where you're going to list the local Bijou's screening schedule, that sort of thing. A dedicated book section, much rarer. And here, at the end of my life, <laughs> just like at the beginning, I once again have the incredible pleasure of being a small town books editor. And in this case, it is dedicated books. In the back of the news section, look at this beautiful thing. Full color photographs. This is a full color piece by my esteemed editor in chief. And if, if you go to the middle of this section of the, of the news section, you get books. Look at how beautiful that is. Two full pages of books coverage. There's only one annoying ad right there, but otherwise, two full pages. And I don't know if you can tell, you've got uh, Books Promiscuously Read, you've got What is a Dog, you've got Plague Years by Lawrence Wright. Uh, what you can tell from that coverage uh, is that my decision here was not to make this local coverage, right? My wonderful editor at the Vineyard Gazette has decided very much to continue the, the tradition of the Vineyard Gazette being local coverage. So you either, the only books that he's going to consider for review will be books that are set on the vineyard or writ, written by someone who's set on the vineyard. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, no. No matter how interesting the book is, it has to have a vineyard connection. And that is legitimate. And there are plenty of small town editors that make that decision. I am not one of them. <laughs> I, I made it clear right away to my ed editor in chief that I wanted my book section to be uh, competitive, not local, not, not provincial. I don't believe there's any such thing as a local reader. Uh, so I don't want the, the section to be that. So in, in this particular section, I don't know if you could make it out, but it's always, it's always my pleasure to show it to you again. I have a column here on coming attractions, summer reads of one kind or another, fiction and nonfiction, and then a bunch of reviews of books. You've got Bill, uh, Bill, uh, James Patterson's The Shadow, What is a Dog? You've got uh, Nazi history down at the bottom there. All in full color, all just beautiful. I want to stress that you can get this newspaper for $30 a year. It comes out once a month, the beginning of the month. I just saw the proofs for the August issue. They are to die for. <laughs> just beautiful. <laughs> uh, and this came in the mail, so of course I wanted to show it to you uh, because it is my pride and joy, I swear. As happy as I am to get a copy of the Vineyard Gazette where I am in there as a, reviewing a book, uh, and believe me, I am overwhelmingly happy to get the Vineyard Gazette in the mail when I am in there reviewing a book. Because I read the Vineyard Gazette for decades uh, before I wrote for them. I, I knew the, an old editor, a legendary old editor of the paper. I used to spend an enormous amount of time on the Vineyard. I knew that editor and his dog quite well. 
and he often used to say on on slow wobbly dog walks he often used to say why don't you write up a book review for me i'm sure i have something on my desk that would interest you and i always said uh no i don't review books anymore what a moron <laughs> i should i should have been reviewing books the whole time and now all of a sudden i am reviewing books again for the vineyard gazette so that is a joy to me but oh my there is no joy like getting your own book section in the mail <laughs> so that is that is a periodical that came that came yesterday uh it warms the cockles of my heart it's northern georgia it's it's on the ground distribution is fairly small but uh two things one if you want the joy of a big bustling pretty full color local but not completely local newspaper thudding onto your doorstep every month thirty dollars a, a year will do it for you and that will get you my own book section uh not a book section where i am a regular reviewer but a book section where i am the editor uh i commission the reviews i make sure of everything i make sure that what of what it looks like and what it reads like a tremendous pleasure you can either do that or if you if you don't want to do that or if you live for instance overseas uh big canoe is does post the the digital version of every newspaper uh, online with no paywalls so you you could read it and if you enjoy it you could feel free to send an email <laughs> to that effect especially if you like the book section <laughs> but anyway uh those were two things that i got in the mail and then another thing that i wanted to show you that is a book uh and it's this it's peter seawald's continuation of his life of uh pope benedict the 16th this is volume two uh volume one came out i think last year or maybe the year before that this is as you can see this this is all the way up to the present so this is from vatican ii uh where benedict was where joseph ratzinger was very much involved uh to his papacy and then his retirement a pope who retired the first pope in 500 years to retire and, and live still as pope emeritus uh in the papal gardens and uh the first volume of this biography tremendously impressed me I thought it was just sympathetic, but wonderfully done. Uh, and this is even more impressive. Just the, the two volumes are, are, are amazing together. Just an amazing, amazing experience. Uh, not only shrewd and widely encompassing. I mean, Benedict sat and talked with the author quite a bit. But also uh, just pristinely written. I, I, can't, I can't praise it enough. I, don't, I know that a lot of you will say, well, you know, you were, you were raised Catholic. Uh, so you're a little bit prejudiced, but uh, if anything, that's going to prejudice me against. And and certainly there is a lot to be prejudiced against. I myself don't think that Joseph Ratzinger, that the young Joseph Ratzinger, I don't think that the young Joseph Ratzinger needed all that much convincing to align himself as a youth with the Nazis, for instance. I don't think he needed any convincing at all. And I don't think it needs stressing that that ratzinger's performance during the explosion of the sex scandal the rape scandal as christopher Hitchens used to call it uh, that afflicted the catholic church and is still going on his response was horrible even in on the spectrum of possible horrible responses his response was horrible uh not it was thoroughly evil and we know from what little documentation we've been able to pry loose from the vatican that a lot of the church's response to those scandals when they hadn't broken yet when the church knew what was happening but nobody else did that a lot of that the stuff that the church did it did specifically with ratzinger's signature on it moving convicted uh, or absolutely confirmed pedophile predators moving them from one location to another instead of sequestering them ratzinger had his hands all over that sort of those sorts of decisions where a, a local parish priest in milwaukee where the complaints would be would be unignorable where it was obvious that this priest was was committing enormous amounts of damage psycho psychological and sexual rape to every young boy that came his way in that parish and instead of defrocking that priest and just letting him go or defrocking him and then calling the authorities and turning over documents in private to make sure that that person was behind bars instead of doing that and instead of taking that priest who the, keep in mind ratziger in his position at the time would have known the priest was guilty no doubt at all no he said she said would have known he was guilty instead of 
defrocking him and turning him over to the authorities. Talk about talk about uh, Archbishop Beckett. Uh, and instead of taking that priest and rusticating him in some position that has nothing to do with children, that has nothing to do with altar boys or catechism class members or anything like that, that's behind stone walls and far away from the public. The church has any number of such places. They found a bolt hole like that for Cardinal Bernard Law when they needed to, uh, who also oversaw a sexual scandal. They found bolt holes for him where he was far away from the public. Instead of doing even that, you would just, Ratzinger would just uh, authorize taking these predators and moving them. So you're in Milwaukee, all of a sudden we're going to put you in Pasadena. They don't know anything about you. <laughs> a new priest, oh, he looks so kindly. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor if Timmy is an altar boy under his service. Oh my God, and the church knew about this, and Ratzinger knew about it. So there's a lot of negative stuff to cover here. And Seawall doesn't brush any of it over. But this is still... Even given that, this is still the kind of literate and intelligent, detailed biography that really every public figure should get. I think every public figure of this kind of stature, certainly every world leader, should get such a biography. If only because now you have a clear starting point for anyone in the future. No one is ever going to be able to write a biography of Pope Benedict without writing, without heavily consulting these volumes. Benedict's never going to give these kinds of interviews again to anybody. Uh, so one way or another, uh, that is a book that we could talk about. In addition to in addition to the uh, the print newspapers where I happen to appear, uh, so we're just going to move on. We're going to parallel on here because we have a lot of content. We're not making a video about nothing. We have a lot of content to get through. So now we'll go on to book news, uh, and uh, well, let's see. I've got. Uh, I've got a bunch of books. I've got a bunch of stuff for book news. Number one is the ongoing drama of Caliber, the app Caliber on this channel, which is a, sort of a, a, a warehousing and conversion app for ebooks. A lot of you swear by it. And I, well, certainly a lot of videos on, on YouTube swear by it, where you upload your digital library onto Caliber. It's a place where that library can live, first of all, that doesn't tie it to a device. And also you can fiddle around with it. You can, you can arrange those titles, you can give them covers, you can send them, you can reformat Mobi to EPUB, EPUB to Mobi, and f send them to devices. So that your, your lonely Kindle Paperwhite doesn't need to have only 10 books on it, it can have 1,000 books on it. Uh, I have been hearing for years that Calibre is really an app that I should try, and I have tried it a couple of times and it has never worked for me. And I don't mean never worked in the sense of it just didn't jive with me, that I, I didn't like the flow. I mean, it didn't work at all. <laughs> uh, and I have tried every step. You, some of you have been, up until just the other day, very generous in taking the time to copy out and annotate all the steps I need to go through that I might be getting wrong. Some of you have been very patient with that. I swear, I have the best viewers, the best imaginary YouTube friends imaginable. Uh, and I have followed all of those steps, making sure that the caliber has the email of the device, making sure the device has the email of caliber, making sure that all of these things are lined up just perfectly. And it just doesn't work. Even down to the template, in the, the screenshots that a lot of you are sending me of, of using your own caliber on your own desktop, the template, what you're actually looking at, looks different than the only template I can find to download for my own desktop. D down to the just to the level of of function buttons being missing so in your in your step-by-step -step descriptions of what i should do you have a, a red arrow pointing you, you want to press this button and this will give you a drop down menu that button isn't there for me it's not that i that i see it but i don't get how to do it it's not there caliber actually doesn't seem to work for me i must be doing something absolutely fundamental wrong uh, but as it is <laughs> as it is it is it is largely uh, a failure. Using that is largely a failure. And the only reason that's not a catastrophe is because I do most of my reading on my iPad and the iPad works just fine. I mentioned the other day that the, the Kindle books that I most read are uh, Kindle Unlimited, which goes straight to my Kindle account, and uh, NetGalley, the online advanced reader copy service those books also go straight to my Kindle, and those go to my Kindle app, and they show up on all uh, on my Kindle app on all devices, which is great because that means it, those show up on my Kindle Oasis, uh, my Kindle Paperwhite rather. I haven't got a Kindle Oasis. I figure it's not worth spending the extra money to get another Kindle device if I can't get Caliber to work. 
It'd be one thing if I could if I could get Caliber to work and I could suddenly get a Kindle Oasis and put two thousand books on it, that would be one thing. But if it's still just Kindle Unlimited and and NetGalley, I have already a Kindle Paperwhite, a fine little device. I don't need more than that. And those also show up here. Uh, so there isn't any urgent need to get Caliber to work, and because Caliber doesn't work, there's no urgent need for me to get a Kindle Oasis. I was kind of thinking of that. Several of you were saying, you know, it's an upgrade from the Kindle Paperwhite. The the uh, the digital resolution on the screen is noticeably better. The thing is faster. It's lighter. The ergonomic uh, grip, it has an, an odd shape. It's not a flat thing like this. It has a bulk on one side so that you can grip it better. Uh, and it has page turn buttons. And a lot of you were saying, uh, yes, it has all of those improvements, but the metal, it's all metal. It's all metal backed. A lot of you were, were pointing out, several of you pointed out that that gives it a sort of non-bookish feel. I don't mind that at all. I was seriously thinking about so-called pulling the trigger on a Kindle Oasis, and I may still do it. Uh, but I think the, the thing that I would need in order to do that would be for Caliber to work. And I get the feeling sometimes that I'm that close to Caliber working, but so far, so far, no, no. I will, I will activate the Caliber app. It will sense books on my desktop. It will upload them when I, when I tell it to, then I will say, email it to this device, to the email for my Kindle Paperwhite. And it'll, the little thing tasks where it says what it's working on, That'll work for a while, and then a, a window will pop up and say, error, could not do. And no explanation. No no uh, drop-down window to, to figure out what the reason is. Just, it doesn't work. I think what I need to do in order to get Caliber to work is to have a tech-savvy person here and make it work themselves. Where I'm not saying anything. Or I'm just sitting, sitting next to them saying, here you go, make this work. Make it so that you can transfer these thousand books from this device to my Kindle Paperwhite. And I'm going to sit here in silence. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to carp. I'm just, the only things I'm going to say are when you need me to call out information that you don't know. So I, I need a tech-savvy person to sit here in this room and do that. Once it's done once, I'm sure it'll work. So who will that tech-savvy person be? Will it be a young 20-something weightlifter? Will it be Olive's husband? <laughs> who knows who that tech-savvy person will be? The first one that does it. I'm sure I'll get Caliber to work, and I'm pretty sure that once Caliber works, I will celebrate by getting a Kindle Oasis. But in the meantime, uh, there was also some, one of you also suggested something I wanted to put before the rest of you: an Onyx Books B O O X Poke Three. Onyx Books Poke Three. One of you, a very tech savvy friend, suggested that maybe this would be a really good e-ink e-reader for me, and I was wondering before I, I've been looking around or reading, watching YouTube reviews. But I want to know, if, just by chance, any of you actually have an Onyx Books Poke 3, or maybe 2, or maybe 1. An Onyx Books Poke, if you have it, what do you think of it? Is it really good? Do you like it? I'd love to hear more opinions on that. Uh, and that also raised a question of, uh, in terms of tech talk, in terms of devices, uh, an iPad Mini. Because when I when I noticed that... Uh, that the Kindle app was working just fine on my iPad, but not working on my Kindle Paperwhite. I thought, well, one of the things you like about the Kindle Paperwhite is the smaller form factor. And you have an iPad Mini. And if, it, if all those apps work on your iPad, they'll work on your iPad Mini. So you should find the iPad Mini, fire it up, and give it another try. Maybe it's the thing. And I can't find it. <laughs> I said this video would be full of stuff. I didn't say it'd be full of interesting stuff. <laughs> I can't find my iPad Mini. Is it possible that I factory reset it and sent it to one of you? Is that possible that I did that? I would say that's impossible, but I love you all. I probably wouldn't say no to that. If one of you said, I'm a high school student, I have no money whatsoever, I really want an iPad, do you have one you can spare? I'd probably say yes to that. Did I do that? Or is it just that I can't find, <laughs> that I can't find this thing? I will continue to search, but I have one place, one bottomless pit where all the tech goes. It doesn't go anywhere else. And I can't find this my iPad Mini to give it a try. And some of you who've watched this channel for a while and know my proclivities <laughs> will know already what I'm going to say next. Which is, when I spent half an hour looking for my iPad Mini and couldn't find it, the first thought that crossed my mind was not, you need to look harder. The first thought that crossed my mind was, maybe you should buy another iPad Mini. And 
I'm still thinking of that. It's so much fun. What deals are out there? Hmm? Maybe an iPad mini fifth generation? Something really light and really fast? <laughs> Very tempting. The next commission checky poo that comes in, maybe it will be Pope Benedict that pays for a new iPad mini. On the assumption that I sent it to one of you. I, I, I can't, I've been racking my brains. The other al alternative is that maybe I gave it to Mark Richardson and his wife for the kids. But I think I would remember that. I, I would remember that. <laughs> I want one way or another. Uh, that's the uh, the only other e-reading update here is is now I'm wondering if maybe an iPad Mini is the way to go. That way I don't have to worry about caliber. I would like to archive all of my ebooks in one safe place, but I, I've got a long find this long without doing that. And aside from caliber, it, the iPad reading experience seems to be the way. I actually love it. Is that maybe the way to go? And if it is. Do I maybe need a new iPad mini? Maybe with a nice cover, a nice sturdy case? I don't know about the case. I'm always tempted by them because they're, you know, a nice thick leather case or something magnetic with a keyboard or something like that always appeals to me. And I always end up preferring naked Apple technology, whether it's the, the MacBook or an iPad or even the iPhone. I always end up preferring just the sleek naked paper, uh, the, the metal and glass of it. I think maybe I'm channeling Steve Jobs because he always preferred that. He was confronted a couple of times towards the end of his life with the idea of putting an iPad in a case and he hated it. The, he meant this as a work of art as well as an incredible tool to the extent that he wasn't an incredible tool. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, uh, in addition to book news of a technical nature, there are also actual books. I know this is strange, but we'll finish up with actual books on this jam-packed mega stuff video. This is not a video about nothing. Okay, <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the Booker Long List. <laughs> to finish up, we'll talk about books and we'll talk about the Booker Long List. The Booker Long List has come up a couple of times on this channel this week. The Long List was announced. A lot of you sent me emails. I leave my email on every video. Feel free to email me about anything. Book recommendations, personal recommendations, dog questions. I had an email uh, just a couple of days ago. Somebody said, is a young person who said, my mother is driving me crazy. And I don't know who else to talk to about it, but you. I cannot tell you how honored I am to get an email like that. I take those things very seriously. I was incredibly honored to do that. Had many, many emails like that on many, many subjects. I love it. Even if my advice is no good to you, I love the conversation. Uh, but Many of you wrote and said, could you do a reaction video to the Booker Long List for 2021? And I, I saw the Long List. I have an opinion about book prizes. And I believe that they're driven by current year Twitter politics, identity politics. I don't think they have anything to do with the books at all, with the quality of the book. I don't think the books are being read. And I don't think it's just the Booker Prize. I think that's good, that identity politics is going to rule literary prizes for the rest of the year or for the rest of our lives. So I mentioned that in the preface to a tag video, and then I mentioned it again. <laughs> uh, and the emails have kept coming. A lot of you understand that. A lot of you are thinking that there is some, you know, some validation of what I'm saying. I'm, maybe it's not just an old coot yelling at clouds. There might be some, something to it. Uh, but one way or another, a lot of you said, okay, whether we agree about current year Twitter politics or not, You've still been talking about books to, uh, as several of you put it in your emails individually, you said you've still been talking about books to me for years. So it seems odd for there to be just a blank space here. Could you at least say if you've read any of the books on the long list and what you thought of them? That seems to me to be legitimate, <laughs> especially since I am claiming that the judges are not going to read the books. So, uh, so I, I took another list at the long list. I have read six books on the long list, which is a, sh a small showing, I admit. Ordinarily, on a book or long list, I've read a lot more than six, but I read uh, Second Place by Rachel Cusk. Needless to say, I am not on the Rachel Cusk bandwagon. This is first draft wet wash. It, it, lazily written, not revised, formless, functionless, entirely auto-fiction, entirely... Uh, it, it's, it's, it is the, the literature of privilege. People say, you know, cis het white men, old cis het white men are privileged writers. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely they are not. In the 21st century, 
This is the literature of privilege, this kind of formless wet wash that is not only allowed a pass into a major publisher, but then extolled. Otessa Moshfe, uh, uh, Sally Rooney, this, this sort of stuff that is let loose on the publishing world and then screamed in praise. That is real privilege. <laughs> you can get third-rate, boring stuff like this hype and praised. That's privilege. This second glance, or second place was incredibly boring. Uh, just incredibly boring. Nothing actually happens that isn't telegraphed, unlikely, and dumb. <laughs> so, uh, then there was The Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris. You would think on paper uh, that a lot of elements in this thing would appeal to me. I was on paper very pleased by the prevalence of historical fiction, for instance, on the long list. I'm a big fan of historical fiction. This is not historical fiction. This is anachronism fiction. Uh, this is This is the author looking at the vast expanse of history before Twitter and saying, be better. And that gets boring pretty quick, <laughs> pretty quick. I stopped counting the counterfactual anachronisms in The Sweetness of Water after page three. I kept reading, but the, there are no, the characters aren't there. The development isn't there. You, the, the novel is not a drama in which active parts can resonate or not resonate with you. Instead, it's a litmus test, and there's a side you're supposed to be on and a side you're not supposed to be on. That that gets uh, pretty irritating pretty quick. So, uh, uh, so I wasn't I wasn't all that impressed with it. We'll see how far it goes. I think I know how far it will go. The, the next one that I read was Clara and the Sun by Ishiguro. I hadn't read this for a while. I sort of held off on it and held off on it, and finally I read it. Once I saw it getting lots of critical attention, I read it. And it's a it, it reminded me a lot of The Silence by Don DeLillo. It is a technological uh, musing by somebody who isn't interested in technology, doesn't get it. It, it struck me as a carpetbagging work in the same way that the so-called science fiction of Margaret Atwood strikes me as carpetbagging, where the author doesn't feel it. They're just, they're just, you know, they're having a kids these days when I, when I was younger, this, this sort of crap didn't happen moment and making a novel out of it but it's uh i i i found it boring i guess is the thread that's running through a lot of these uh the next one was a town called solace by mary lawson the main thing that struck me about this novel i read an e an e uh copy of it the main thing that struck me about it is how poor the prose was the pro the prose is really bad and that that uh and persistently so noticeably so and that underscores the point uh, that i uh, that i'm trying not to hammer on in this video which is that the prose doesn't matter the, the prose is the only thing that doesn't matter about these books. The marketing, the identity of the author, all that stuff matters, but not the prose. Otherwise, this thing, if this thing had been submitted to literary judges in a brown paper bag with no identification at all, it wouldn't have made it even to consideration for the long list. It's, it's just poorly done. Uh, then also, The Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. Maggie Shipstead, an author I kind of like. Then The Great Circle, I kind of like. It's a it's a big, ambitious historical novel, twice as long, I think, as the, the next longest thing that Maggie Shipstead's ever written. But it's it's decidedly ordinary. It's a good read. But if you read it without thinking about identity boxes, the last thing that will cross your mind is that this deserves to be a candidate for one of the most major literary awards in the world. That will never cross your mind when you read it. And yet here it is. <laughs> uh, and then the last one, uh, Light Perpetual by Francis Spooford, uh, which of the six that I have read is by far the best written, but wasn't all that involving. It's more... It's more of the same. In none of these cases would I have finished the book and thought, major literary award contender, and not one of them. And I have read some contenders like that this year. I've read quite a few of them, that I, where I finished the book and think, that was a serious book. That was a serious, a seriously good novel. Uh, none of these. Now, that I might get that reaction to some of the other books, the ones that I haven't read, but these are the ones that I've read, for those of you who've, who've asked, these are the ones that I've read. Uh, and then... We'll finish up with uh, three books. I want to show you pictures. Uh, the, f the first two are Blast from the Past uh, that I have... Or no, actually... Okay, well, two of them are. Here's one. The Annotated American Gods by Neil, Di Neil Gaiman. This is his book that some of you may have seen is made into a very intriguing television show, I think, on Netflix. Uh, and th the publisher decided to come up with an annotated version. So it's oversized and you've got the text, and then on the column on either side of the page, you've got annotations for all of the illusions that Neil Gaiman fills the book with. And uh, the reason I'm showing it to you is because I don't want this copy. 
And I wonder if there's a Neil Gaiman super fan out there who would want this copy. If so, kindly let me know, either in the comments field or just email me. Uh, because if, if you, if you, I'd be happy to mail it to you wherever you live in rural New Zealand. Same thing with this next one. This next one is the new annotated H.P. Lovecraft Beyond Arkham. Uh, I know that Lovecraft has a lot of passionate fans on BookTube, and I'm not one of them. I thought this was extremely interesting. Leslie Klinger is one of the great annotators of our time, uh, but not interesting enough for me to keep. And I imagine that one of you out there probably has the previous annotated volume of Lovecraft and maybe doesn't have this and maybe might want it in, in, in this case as well. Feel free to let me know. Either leave a comment on this video. I, I read my comments. I'm in my comments field all the time. Uh, or email me and let me know, and I'd, I'd be happy to mail it to you. Uh, then another another uh, newer book that I wanted to show you that I just finished uh, that I loved uh, is this. Uh, the Penguin Book of Dragons. What a book. Oh, my. You will be familiar with this uh, sort of trend with Penguin Classics. Penguin Book of Ghosts, Penguin Book of the Undead, Penguin Book of Exorcisms. They've been doing anthologies like this, and they've been, those anthologies have been doing very well, and not just because of the Penguin logo. It's because of the, the genuine insight of the Penguin editorial team. That's the only thing that makes an anthology work or not work. You can't brand your way to success with a collection because you're sending it out to opinionated people. It's just that they're really good anthologies. This is a terrific, terrific anthology of dragon literature. And I don't think it's out yet, but it's coming out. We'll probably see a physical copy on this channel in due time. I strongly, strongly recommend it. You're going to love it. From the introduction all the way, everything in it, you're going to love the choices in this book. Uh, and do I have do I have something else? What, what else was there? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, there is one more thing to finish up here. I read this. Wendy Holden's new book, The Duchess. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy Holden was the author of a book called The Royal Tutor, uh, or about... Uh, the young woman who tutored Princess Elizabeth and Princess uh, Margaret uh, during the dark days of the Depression of World War II, before before Elizabeth became queen. Uh, that woman was persona non grata for the royal family. She wrote a memoir about the two little princesses, and, and the, the royal family cut her out of all living memory because of that, as the ultimate betrayal. Uh, and Wendy Holden wrote a wonderful, uh, sympathetic, feeling book about that young woman's life. And I read it. I really liked it. I brooded it up all over the place. And I also did an, an, a video interview with Wendy Holden. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and she said, my next book, I will make sure to keep you in, in the loop. And gradually I realized her next book. Oh, did you like Wendy Holden too, baby? Hi. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> uh, gradually I realized what her next book was about. The Duchess in question here is Wallace Warfield Simpson, the twice-divorced American adventuress who took, who pinched the king, <laughs> who, who ensnared uh, the man who would become King Edward VIII in order to make him choose between his throne and her love. And he decided to abdicate in order to live with her and sponge off the royal funds for the rest of their life as the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And when I learned that Wendy Holden I dearly esteem, was going to write a novel favorable towards Wallace Warfield Simpson, I saw red. <laughs> I read the uh, the novel. I had, I, had, I had her send me a copy. And I read the novel. Uh, and it's... Okay. It's terrific. <laughs> okay, this is a fantastic historical novelist. You should be reading her books just in general. This is terrific. And it is even more favorable towards Mrs. Simpson than I expected it to be. I am not favorable towards Mrs. Simpson, so you can count. This comes out, I think, at the end of September. You can absolutely count on another video interview in which I invite Wendy Holden as Daniel into the lion's den to defend Wallace Warfield Simpson against a judge of one. <laughs> now, I have no doubt that you're going to like her more than you like me. She's much nicer than I am. And she's also a terrific author, so I have no doubt that the debate is going to stir interest in the book, and it should. But we'll see who wins. <laughs> I shall pull no punches. <laughs> uh, but anyway, there you go. There you go. That is an hour-long mega stuff video of all the bookish and book-adjacent and non-book-adjacent stuff that's on my mind 
one piece of content after another. This was a dense, dense video. This was not a 40 minute video about nothing. This was about a lot. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> not that my whole life is governed by Brian and Bookish. <laughs> Thank you, Book Two.